Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Simon Wardley. Hello, can you all hear me at the back? Is that, uh, is that clear? Perfect, super. So uh, my name is Simon Wardley. Um, before I start, has anybody heard of my form of mapping at all? A few of you, and basically nobody has. <laughs> Excellent, super. Right, so a um, bit of background about myself. I'm a scientist by training. Um, so before I start, quick word of warning. Uh, I like graphs. Uh, this is a graph, uh, the level of audience pain, that's you, against the number of slides given in, in, in roughly an hour's presentation. I reckon there's a safe limit of about 60. Now, being a scientist, I like to experiment, so we'll be using no less than 262. I know what you're thinking, uh, what the fiddlesticks is happening here, uh, but don't worry before you run away, because I'm going to give you a map in terms of what we're going to speak about, because I like maps. So here's my map. We're going to start off on the subject of strategy. And that's the high point of the evening, because after this we head south, and we'll talk about maps, and then we'll get on to patterns. And after this, we've got a bit of a magical mystery tour, uh, covering subjects like serverless, uh, China, and Brexit. <laughs> By the way, who's got an IT background here? Roughly, hands up. Right, so if I said something like serverless, how many people would know what the hell I'm talking about? Uh, most of you, have you, has any, have you all heard of cloud? <laughs> right, okay, super. Well, well, okay, we're going to start with the subject of strategy. Uh, for me, this is a big personal subject. It started off in 1995 uh, when I was at the Arts Hotel in Barcelona. I was working for a company uh, called Frito-Lay, uh, part of PepsiCo, and uh, the SVP handed me the document and said, this is our strategy, what do you think? Uh, now, it was 1995, I was much younger. Uh, I leafed through the uh, pages of the document, saw words like innovation, uh, culture, efficiency. I didn't have a clue, so I said, it looks all right to me. Um, I didn't want to sound daft. Anyway, 10 years later, I'm the CEO of this company uh, for Tango, very profitable, uh, growing revenue, 16 different lines of business, about 10 million users roughly in total. Uh, but it had a problem, and, and the problem was me. I was the CEO. Uh, so rather than being a chess-playing master, I was actually an alchemist. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Um, I was making it up as we went along. But it was okay, because despite the fact that I was the fake CEO, uh, we, we, had, we had lots of revenue and we were very profitable. Now, we had strategy documents. Um, I'd written them. Uh, they didn't make sense to me. So I handed them to one of my members of staff and said, what do you think? And I could see them, you know, looking there, leafing through the pages, nodding. And they handed it back and said, made sense to me. And so I had that moment of, well, I haven't got a clue, and obviously they're just saying what I said in the past. So we had vision statements. This is our vision statement of 2003. Our strategy is customer focus. We will lead an innovative effort of the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. Uh, we'd adopted something called extreme programming in, in 2000. Um, but the problem with this, I just pinched it from another company. Uh, <laughs> So I, I, I was sort of starting to panic that despite the fact that, you know, we were very profitable and revenue was growing, that other people would rumble uh, that I didn't know what I was talking about. So I would go around listening to other CEOs talking about strategy. And I took a tape recorder with me, and I would record the words they would say. And I called these words, these special phrases, I called them business-level abstractions of a healthy strategy, or BLAS for short. And I do this every couple of years. This was 2014. Here are the common blars. Uh, digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive advantage, ecosystem, blah, blah, blah. Now, if I did it today, you'd probably find some new words. Uh, any suggestions? Blockchain. blockchain. Everybody's got to have a bit of blockchain. Anything else? AI, yes. You've got to put a bit of AI in there. Anything else? Any, any VR, anybody? 
Yeah, VR, you've got to have a bit of VR, whatever. We're a funeral parlor. Um, but anyway, so um, I, I got this, uh, these common blahs, and I got these companies' strategy documents, and I thought, well, um, I would combine them. So I, I took the strategy documents and created what I called the blah template. So our strategy is blah, we will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah and blah to build a blah. And then I, I combined the blahs and blah templates and also generated 64 random strategies. <laughs> so number one, our strategy is customer focus. We will lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data to build a collaborative cloud-based ecosystem. Blah, blah, blah. It's all random gibberish. Uh, number two, our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a great effort of the market through our use of customer focus, competitive advantage, and disruptive. I can barely say the words. These are so painful. <laughs> so I sent them around, and I got about 400 responses of three basic types. Uh, the first one was, this is the exact wording from our business plan. <laughs> The second one is I've seen two of these used already. Uh, and the third of my favorite was, are you for hire? <laughs> <laughs> so a friend of mine has now put this all online, by the way. This is strategy as a service. So if you ever need a strategy, you just type in the URL, and it will automatically generate you one based upon nothing whatsoever. So our strategy is collaborative. We will lead an open effort of the market through our use of big data and social. And if you don't like it, it's really simple. You just press refresh <laughs> and, uh, and <laughs> until you do. So job done. That's the, uh, that's the end of the, well, no. Um, so I thought there must be more to it than this. Um, the, the thing with me is I hadn't done an MBA, so I assumed everybody actually knew how to do this properly. Um, but I didn't want anybody to rumble. So I um, went back and started reading books like Sun Tzu, The Art of, uh, the Art of War. So Sun Tzu talked about five factors that mattered in competition. Uh, the first is understand your purpose, your moral imperative. The second is understand the landscape that you're competing in. The third is understand climactic patterns, so how that landscape is changing. The fourth is understand doctrine, the universal principles of organization and structure. And finally, you get onto leadership. I was quite excited by that. And then I came across John Boyd. Anybody ever heard of John Boyd? Uda, Uda loops. So you've got the game, that's your purpose. Your next step is to observe the environment, that's the O, first O in Uda. So that's landscape and climactic patterns. So what does it look like and how is it changing? Then you orientate yourself around that with principles, and then you decide where you're going to attack and then you act. I was quite, well, this sort of makes sense to me. This is 2005. I, I'm quite pleased by this. And I would ask others what they thought, and they said, oh, it doesn't matter. Strategy is all about the importance of why. And that's a really interesting idea, except for there are two whys. There's the why of purpose and the why of movement, and they are very different. So if you think of a game of chess, your why of purpose might be to win the game. The why of movement is, do I move this piece or do I move that piece? Now, if I move the pawn, I gain a positional advantage. Uh, but if I move the queen, it's checkmate. So it's through action I actually learn. So I had this strategy cycle, and I thought, right, I'm going to apply this to myself. So I looked at my company. Um, in terms of uh, purpose, it was a mess. It was all over the place. But it's OK. I had this, this cycle. As I looped around it, I could get better, I thought. So the, the purpose was a bit of a mess. But we wanted to be an online photo and all these other things as well. OK, but how did we understand the landscape? And that brings me on to my next topic, which is maps and the issue of situational awareness. Now, how many of you have military backgrounds? One. Is situational awareness important in the military? I will pay you later. Thank you, sir. <laughs> right. So I'm going to explain situational awareness with three examples. The first is Vikings. Now, Vikings, very frightening people. 
this is how Vikings used to navigate. From Herman, head due west towards Half, and you will sail north of Hatland until you say so that you just glimpse it in clear. They use stories. You spend 10 years l learning your epic story. Now you're in charge of a boat, and you navigate with a story. Now that means that. So quick question. What would you use to navigate? Would you use a visual map or a verbal story? What would you use? A map. Yes? Right, good. What do we use in business? <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear. <laughs> Stories. Right, super. Right, so the next example is chess world. I want you to imagine you live in a world where everybody plays chess, but no one's ever seen the board. All you've seen are these characters on the screen. And you play the game very simply. Uh, you press a button, pawn. Your opponent sees what you've pressed. They counter, pawn. You see what they've pressed. You counter, pawn. They see what you've pressed. They counter, queen. And the game goes on for ages and ages until somebody wins, or more likely it's a draw. Now, what will happen is we will take these sequences and stick them into our big data systems and come up with magic secrets of success. So if you press queen, I should respond with knight, rook, rook. Works every time. By the way, if you don't um, believe in secrets of success, one of my favorite Harvard Business Review articles from November 2011 is this one. How earlobes can signify leadership potential. This is not an April Fool. It's a serious article about the importance of uh, asymmetries in your earlobes. So if you ever wonder if your company's doing well, when you're in the board, grab the CEO, start measuring their earlobes. <laughs> um, this is, by the way, a deadly series. It's called phrenology of management. It's frightening stuff. Anyway, so what will happen is uh, you're playing this game of chess. You've got 20 years' experience or so. You've got all the books. You've read The Secret of the Queen and all that sort of thing. And then you come up against an utter novice. But they have something you don't. They get to see the board. So you press the button, pawn, uh, they counter. You see pawn, right, you counter, pawn, uh, they move, and the game is over. And the first thing you're going to go is what the fiddlesticks happened there. How did I lose that? You're going to write down this sequence as though it's some magic secret of success. Now, when you use that sequence against the player, what's going to happen? You're going to lose, aren't you? Because they're going to change. So you're going to say, well, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's the speed at which they press the button. So you'll start recording that. How's that going to help you? No. Right. So it must be something else. It must be cultural. They, may, they must be a happy sort of person. How's that going to help you? No. OK. Right, quick question. Uh, what would you use to learn? Secrets of success or context-specific play as described by a board? What would you use? Context-specific play, you think? Yeah, OK. What do we use in business? Secret source. Oh, secret source. All right, so the last example is Themistocles. So Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general, had a problem. Uh, the Persians were invading, about 170,000 odd Persians. Uh, what he decided to do was to block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along the coastal road into Thermopylae. It's a narrow pass where a small number of troops could defend against a larger force. Now, there was about 4,000 odd Greeks, including 300 Spartans, fantastic. You're answering all the questions, sir. Somebody else join in, please. All right, so I want you to, you to imagine you're all members of the uh, Greek army. You know, you're all Athenians, say, the Athenian city-state. I'm Themistocles, and it's the eve of battle. So I'm giving you purpose and moral imperative. You wanna get, we want to defend against the, the invading Persians. But then I say to you, I don't have a map. I don't actually understand the landscape. I don't understand the environment. But have no fear, for I have created a SWOT diagram. 
strengths, a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave, uh, weaknesses, the E4s might stop the Spartans turning up, a truckload of Persians are turning up, uh, opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans, we're Athenian, we actually hate the Spartans, and the threats, the Persians get rid of us, and the Oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced in a few thousand years. <laughs> so, quick question. What would you use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Uh, position and movement described by a map or a magic framework like a SWOT diagram? Somebody other than him. <laughs> what would you go for? What would you use? A map. Right, excellent. So you know what's coming. What do we use in business? Framework, excellent. So if I go back to uh, chess versus alchemy, and I look at navigation, learning, and strategy, then chess, it's all visual. It's context-specific learning. It's all about position and movement. It's what we call a high-level situational awareness environment. It's a bit like the military. If you ask a general, why did you bomb that hill? They won't say, because I read a consultant report that 67% of other generals are bombing hills. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> they're not going to tell you, I thought it would make a good story. Okay? It's all about position and movement. It's all about where. Now, alchemy, on the other hand, is all about storytelling, secrets of success, and magic frameworks. It's what we call a low-level situational awareness environment. And that's where I was as this fake CEO. And I wanted to be over on that side. And I realized that what I was missing, and what obviously everybody else in the world knew, because they did MBA courses, uh, well, what I was missing was I had no map. So I had to create a map. That was my problem in 2005. Now, what's special about a map? Well, maps have certain characteristics. One, they are visual. Two, they are context-specific. This is a battle of uh, Thermopylae. It's not the Battle of Waterloo, say. They have an anchor. In this case, it's a compass. And chessboard, the anchor is the board itself. And then you have position of pieces relative to the anchor. So this is north, south, east, or west of that. And lastly, you have movement and consistency of movement. So if I want to go from Athens to Thebes, which direction would I go? North. West. Yeah? Okay. If I went uh, northwest and I didn't discover Thebes, uh, and I, I went south and suddenly disco discovered Thebes, what would that tell me? Either the map is wrong or my compass isn't working. Okay? So I didn't have maps. What I, well, I did. I had these things systems maps. Have you ever seen one of these diagrams before? Yes, so uh, a systems map of one of our systems. Now, I'm going to take one thing, CRM, highlight it there, and I'm going to move it. How does that change the map? It doesn't, does it? Right. So if I take a map of the globe and I shift Australia and put it next to Dusseldorf, how does that change the map? Does it? Well, it does. Um, the reason why this doesn't change the map is because it's not a map. It's a systems diagram. You see, in maps, space has meaning. But that's okay. I had these things. Uh, ever seen one of these? Business process maps? Yeah. They're not maps either. I, I, I also... Have you ever seen one of these? Well, they're not maps. I can move things around. Again, it has no meaning. Um, have you ever seen one of these? Digital roadmap? Yes? Okay, so we start off, say, at the top, um, say, social TV. I want to go all the way down to uh, management consultants. That sounds great. So social TV, the first thing I have to do is build a social app. Uh, then I need to do something called review and rex. Uh, then, I, then I've got to build a community and then a blog and then social marketing management before I can do social analytics, to which I can do content marketing. And finally, I can hire a management consultant. It, it's not only not a map, it's, it, 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 it's gibberish. But anyway, um, the, the next one, have you seen one of these before? Yes? Do you want to have a guess? 
Um, well, we've got sort of an anchor in the middle, uh, but we have no concept of movement. It, they are not maps. Bizarrely enough, in business, we keep on using that word maps, and I'm afraid it doesn't mean what we think it means. So how to map? So being a Brit and sitting down and thinking, gosh, I need to somehow map, and this is obviously what everybody else does, um, I was a bit lost. How do you map competition? So the first thing I did was have a cup of tea. <laughs> and while I was having a cup of tea, I realized as a user, I need a cup of tea. And that cup of tea has needs. It needs tea, and it also needs hot water. And hot water has needs. Uh, to do that, I need a kettle and cold water. And a kettle has needs. I, I, I need power. So what I've got here is I've got an anchor at the top, which is the user, and I've got position described in a chain of needs. So I was able to take my systems diagram and go, right, let's put an anchor at the top. It could be a consumer. Uh, we could have the business as a user or regulators. You can have multiple. But let's start off with the customer. Let's, let's look at their needs. And now let's organize the rest of it in a chain of needs. So the top, the customer, uh, what they needed, image manipulation, online photo, then I needed things like CRM, platform, computes, all the way down to the bottom. So what we've got is a value chain from the visible stuff to the user at the top to invisible components at the bottom. I thought that's, that's, that's better, but it's still useless. And it's useless because it doesn't have movement. So if I look at a company like Nokia, Nokia, do you know what Nokia used to be? Well, it's not really a telecommunications company, I suppose. Uh, but, but anyway, do you know what it, used to, what it started off as? Paper mill. And then it was plastics and tires and all that sort of stuff. So the problem with value chains alone is they're not static. They change. So I need to describe movement. So I looked into the issue of power. And power, you start off with the Parthian battery and lots of debate over you know, what sort of power source it was, and somehow it evolved over time and became more of a utility, so Tesla Westinghouse. Now that process of evolution is change, and that describes movement. So it took me about six months, a lot of collection of lots and lots of publications regarding numerous activities, and this is the pattern that I discovered. If you look at the ubiquity versus certainty of something, so how widespread in its applicable market versus our understanding of it. You start off with the genesis of novel and new acts, you get custom-built examples, you get products, then you get rental services, then it becomes widespread, well-defined enough for commodities to appear, and eventually utility services. So I was able to take that as, a, as the movement or evolution of an activity, and it's all driven by demand and supply competition. So I took my value chain, Simply flatten the evolution curve at the bottom. Genesis custom-built product commodity. Simply put things into their space. And that was the first map I produced in 2005. And what I've got is position, anchor, and movement. And also, the space has meaning. Now, I was really excited by that. And I showed other people, and they just went, so what? <laughs> well... The thing is, once you have maps, you can start to learn patterns. And the first patterns you learn are climactic patterns. And these are the rules that influence the game. Uh, these are things which will happen to your systems, whether it's nation state or industry level or individual systems, regardless of what you want. You have no choice over these. And there's 30 of them. And I'm not going through them all. I'm going through a handful. The first pattern is that everything on your map is evolving. If there is supply and demand competition, it is shifting from the left-hand side the, uh, to the right. The second pattern you discover is that as things evolve, their characteristics change as well. So on the left-hand side, it's what we call the uncharted space. It's chaotic, uncertain, unpredictable, changing, different, exciting, a future source of worth. It changes in the middle, and eventually the same act, doesn't matter whether it's money, computing, or penicillin, becomes industrialized, ordered, standard, boring, dull. Now, this was really important for me back in 2005, because we'd adopted extreme programming everywhere and discovered it didn't work. 
Turns out that agile in-house development is extremely strong on the left-hand side when you're focusing on reducing the cost of change. But it's weak on the right-hand side compared to things like Six Sigma and outsourcing, where you've got a different set of characteristics and you're focused on reducing deviation. And both of them are weak in the middle compared to sort of more lean, agile approaches where you're focused on learning and reducing waste. So you start off in a world where it's all extreme programming, it's close uh, interaction between development and customers, you don't even have an MVP. Then you move into a world where you now have an idea, an MVP, it's something you're heading for. Uh, you start using maybe Scrum, start introducing product owners, and eventually it becomes something which you're focused on specification defining because it's now industrialized. What we learned is there's no such thing as one-size-fits-all methods. It doesn't matter whether it's project management or whether it's finance. On the left-hand side, we use VC-type time material-based approaches. Then we were able to shift to outcome-based approach, then more COTS, and finally it was more unit utility. Another pattern we discovered was that past success breeds inertia. So if we got good at something, as it evolved, we had inertia to that change. And there's about 16 different forms. Political capital, social capital, previous investment. An example of this is Blockbuster and Netflix. Right, who was first with a website? Blockbuster, great. Who was first with video ordering online? Blockbuster, great. Who was first with experimenting with video streaming? Blockbuster, great. Who went bankrupt first? OK, so the point about this is people run around saying, oh, you don't want to be like Blockbuster, the dinosaur. They out-innovated everyone. What went wrong? Hmm? Business model. Yeah, absolutely. The stores, it was late fees. Do you remember late fees? OK, some of you won't. Do you, who remembers video cassettes? <laughs> it's going to get less and less over time. So you know how we always forgot to take it back and we, we got charged? Late fees. That was one of the biggest business models. Of course, in the world of downloading content, there are no late fees. Now, the point about this, there is th about 30 common economic patterns. And once you start to learn these, you can do some anticipation. So we had our map in 2005. We knew that compute and platform was going towards a utility. We knew we'd have inertia to the change. We knew it would enable higher order systems to appear. And because of this, there was multiple different points that we could attack. Do we want to differentiate on the product or build the first infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or wait until somebody else does and we'll build on top? Now, in terms of prediction, I said there's 30 odd pa patterns. Some people have taken this to an art form. Uh, there's a book uh, called The Puncher's Scrow, written by, by Tao Klein. Uh, he actually used mapping uh, to map out the future, and he wrote his science fiction book on this. It's just been bought for six figures, it's ten being turned into a Hollywood film. It's described as the uh, next Ready Player One. So, if you're into science fiction, go buy Tao's book. It's brilliant. Right, so you've got purpose, you start understanding your landscape, you start understanding climactic patterns, you start being able to anticipate. The next thing you discover is doctrine. These are universally useful principles regardless of context. So there are certain climactic patterns which will happen to you regardless of what you do. You have no choice. Now there are other patterns you can choose to use. Some of them are universally useful, some of them are context-specific. There are 40 universally useful ones, and we're not going through all of those. I'll just show you some examples. So this is the Emergency Services Mobile Communication Platform. System for communicating between ambulances, fire, and so forth, the emergency services. First time I looked at it, I said, what's the user need? People pointed to the big specification document. It's somewhere in there. The first universally useful principle you learn is to focus on user needs. And that's this, they, they spent an afternoon, mapped out the environment. Mapping forces you, because you're focused on the anchor, to define what the user needs are. So in this case, it's emergency function, point to multiple point, point to point communication. The second universal principle you learn is it's think small, as in know the details. It's not enough just to know the high-end systems. You've got to know the components that make that happen. 
Now, one of the beauties about maps is once you have a map, you can share it with others. And the first thing you discover is that other people are generally building exactly what you're building. So we had maps in Borders Immigration Police, shared them between, and found, you know, we're rebuilding components. Now, this is government. And, of course, government is very, very wasteful. In fact, the worst example I've got in government is 118 systems doing exactly the same thing. Shocking, isn't it? But it's nowhere near as shocking as the private sector. I've got a pharmaceutical company with over 300 teams building enterprise content management systems. In a meeting of their global architects, this became clear. And one of the global architects said, don't worry, I'm building the global enterprise content management system, which was great. But two seconds later, one of the other architects went, so are we. They had five separate efforts to build the global enterprise content management system in a company which had 300 teams building enterprise content management systems. This is a pharma company. But they are nowhere near the worst. I've got a bank, complains it cannot innovate. It has rebuilt risk management over a thousand times. I've got a defense company. We've stopped counting. We reckon there are over 2,000 accounting systems. Whatever you think about government, duplication and waste in government is nothing compared to the examples and horrors you find in the private sector. So you have a map, and the first thing you do is you start removing duplication with it. The next thing you realize is you've got to think small, because the methods you're going to use are going to be different. So you break things into small contracts. And because there's no such thing as one-size-fits-all methods, you apply appropriate methods. So you start using, on the left-hand side, build in-house with agile techniques. In the middle, you're using off-the-shelf, probably lean, lean agile. And on the right-hand side, you're probably outsourcing uh, or using Six Sigma. And you're doing multiple methods at the same time, remembering that everything evolves. Who comes from finance here? One. Do you, are, are you um, proficient in IT as well? No, right. OK. Does everybody know what a world perception server is? It is a self-driving car. Oh, right. OK, so somebody's got an advantage, in which case, Sorry about this. I'm going to pretend you're all from finance, and I'm going to show you a systems diagram for a self-driving car. But because you're from finance, I'm going to translate it all into Elvish. And that's that. OK? <laughs> so nobody has any advantages. Right. So now you've gone to, to finance with the systems diagram, not a map, a systems diagram, and you're, you want to ask finance a question, your finance, OK? So the question I want to ask you is, should we outsource or build our own, A? Should we outsource or build our own, B? So what do you think? <laughs> Any suggestions? Do, do, you, do you sometimes get people asking you, should we outsource this for things you have no, you can be honest, for things you have no understanding of whatsoever? No. Oh, you are fortunate. Uh, well, there's only one of you. All right, so what do you reckon? Should we outsource or build our own, eh? What do you think? You have no idea, do you? All right, so I'm going to give you exactly the same diagram, but this time in mapping format. A, should we outsource or build our own? Outsource. B, should we outsource or build our own? Right. Exactly. So I turn it back into English, and you can suddenly see, fortunately, we outsourced GPS. We didn't try to build our own. We built our own world perception server. The point about this is that we often make decisions without context or understanding of how things are actually evolved. And it's almost it's guesswork. So you use appropriate methods. And because you've broken down into small contracts, you may as well use small teams. So that's cell-based structures. And then what you discover is the culture that you need on the left-hand side. It doesn't matter whether it's finance, engineering, or marketing. So engineering, we'll take engineering on the left, is not the same as engineering on the right. And it's not the same as engineering in the middle. So what you do is you realize you've got multiple cultures. And so you introduce a structure like pioneers, settlers, town planners. 
which recognizes that what you do on the left is not the same as the middle or the right. And then you design for constant evolution, so you introduce systems of theft. So the pioneers, are very, they build, run, and operate the, 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 the sort of novel and new on the left, which often fails. Settlers steal from them and turn it into useful products, and town planners steal from settlers, and they turn it into commodity and utility services, which the pioneers build on. So you create a cycle of theft. Now, this is sort of leading edge thinking 2006, so it's about 12 years old. Uh, there's uh, a wonderful document uh, called Boiling Frogs, uh, which was released by GCHQ, which is our intelligence services. Um, it's all open sourced. It goes through the three-party type structure. So if you're interested in reading, and it's a fabulous document, um, and it's brilliant that they've open sourced it, uh, so do, do go have a read. Okay. So we understand our purpose, we're starting to understand our landscape, we're learning about climactic patterns, there's about 30 of them, so we're starting to be able to anticipate and determine where to attack. Uh, then we're learning how to orientate and organize ourselves, so there's about 40 different basic principles. Now we finally get to the fun bit, which is the leadership bit, which is deciding where we're going to attack and acting. So this is all about context-specific forms of gameplay. So you have a map, you can anticipate where it's going. You can see where to invest. And now what you do is you learn how to manipulate the market. So you can use open approaches to accelerate things. You can use fear, uncertainty, and doubt to slow it down. You can use constraints. There's all sorts of different mechanisms. There's about 70 different ways of manipulating the market. And so what you do is you use that, and then you act which is what I did with my little company. So we used this, mapped out the space, and in two, end of 2005, beginning of 2006, we launched the world's first serverless environment, which was called Zimkey. So people will build entire applications in a single language, JavaScript front and back, back end. It had functional billing. Um, it was all exposed through APIs, and it grew like hotcakes. We anticipated somebody would build a cloud service in terms of infrastructure as a service. I thought it was going to be Google. It turned out it was later on that year. It was Amazon. As soon as they launched, uh, we built on top. Now, unfortunately for my company, we were owned by a bigger company. Uh, that bigger company had a bunch of American consultants come in and explain that the three things that we were doing, uh, cloud, the use of mobile phones as cameras, and 3D printing, were not, was not the future. The future was, in fact, 3D television. So we should shut it all down and spend about a billion on 3D TV. Does anybody have a 3D television here? <laughs> There's one of you. Do you ever use it, sir? No. Right, OK, super. Anybody ever use cloud? <laughs> Mobile phone as a camera? <laughs> 3D printing? Excellent. Well, there we are. So, so I said, well, I'm not interested. So I, I left and, and joined a friend of mine's company uh, called Canonical. And they provide something called Ubuntu. Ever heard of Ubuntu? Perfect. So in 2008, we mapped it out, a uh, simplification of the map. We used the map to work out where to attack. And then I spent half a million and 18 months. And that's where we were in 2008, the blue line at the bottom, about 2% of the operating system market. Um, by the uh, end, by mid-2010, we were about 70% uh, of all cloud computing. It cost me half a million to take the whole cloud market. Um, does anybody remember that? 2008, it was all like Red Hat, Red Hat, Windows, and blah. And then by 2010, it was all Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. No? You don't really work in cloud, do you? No, right. OK, so, so, so we did really well on that, so quite pleased about that one. And then I helped write something called the Better for Less paper, uh, which helped, uh, this was for the coalition back in 2010. And as a result, uh, we introduced things like spend control, and it helped support something called GDS, Government Digital Services, um, which uh, was introduced later. So this was for Francis Maud. Um, and uh, since then, I mean, most of my stuff is nation-state competition and policy stuff. So all interesting stuff. Uh, anyway, in summary, um, there is a cycle to strategy. Uh, but it's really, really important uh, in terms of purpose, landscape, climate, doctrine, and uh, uh, deciding where to attack to understand your landscape. And amazingly, most companies 
don't seem to do that. Now, this process is an iterative process. The more you go around it, the better you get, the more patterns you learn. Um, and, of course, it's important to act. Now, all of that is captured in one single phrase uh, by Deng Xiaoping, which is crossing the river by feeling the stones. So have a sort of direction, but as you go along, take small iterative steps and understand the landscape around you. Now, that is the end of my talk, so thank you very much. Uh, but before we get into questions and answers, I've got a couple of sections to add on. Serverless, China, Fools Mate, Ecosystems, and Brexit. Now, because most of you didn't know serverless, I'm going to quickly zoom through that one and then give you an option on the rest. Serverless. So in the early days, uh, here's computing, early days, our applications were hard-coded into the hardware. I, it was like pipe, you know, tubes and, you know, plugs and things like that, and valves, okay? And applications and compute evolved. And then we got custom-built examples like this, Lions Electronic Office, and we introduced things such as operating systems. Very exciting time. So no longer is our application, if we want to recode it, do we have to pull out plugs and put plugs elsewhere? Um, and we, can, we can actually code. And of course, they evolved. And then we got, very excitingly, uh, new products. Well, the first ever products, like the IBM 650. A uh, wonderful machine, very, very exciting stuff. And so now we got applications with operating systems, and we had these products, and these products had certain characteristics, which enabled us to introduce a novel architectural practice. Now, the characteristic they had was known as high MTTR, high mean time to recovery. So when your server went bang, it would take you months to get a new one. So we built architectural practices based upon that idea. We used something called M plus one, resilient systems. We did something called a disaster recovery test. Have you heard of those? Does anybody remember disaster recovery tests? You do, right, super. And then we do, used to do things like capacity planning because you didn't want to run out on space on the machine um, because it would take you months to get a new one. And they evolved, all very exciting, and we introduced uh, uh, development frameworks, and so we now had applications with emerging coding practice on development frameworks, on operating systems, on good architectural practice, on, on uh, servers as products, or computers as a product, and then they evolved, and, and that's where we ended up. Applications being built with best coding practice on frameworks, running on operating systems with best architectural practice based upon servers. And everything was wonderful. And then this happened. Cloud. Now, the entire cloud can be represented by that little red line at the bottom. That's all it means. It means a shift from product to utility. And that is it. But that also means a change of characteristic. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about engineering, mechanical engineering, or finance. This leads to what is known as co-evolution of practice. So what we had new practices, not based upon bigger, better, more expensive machines, but now based upon a low MTTR. So when my server goes bang, it takes me seconds to get a new one. So now I distribute systems. I design for failure. I use things like chaos engines or chaos monkey. I start doing continuous deployment and continuous integration because I can, because I don't have to wait for several months for the new server to turn up. Now, companies got very excited by this. CEOs would go about how cloud can signify leadership potential. <laughs> They'd moved off earlobes. And they would go, make my stuff cloudy. But what happened is people didn't re-architect. They took stuff which was designed for a high MTTR world and stuck it on a low MTTR world. So what happened is as Amazon had outages, people would run around screaming, the end of cloud is nigh. Do you remember that? So you would go, hang on a minute, shouldn't our architecture evolve as well? To which they would go, burn him heretic. <laughs> that is because best architectural practice for a product world, you know, they had inertia to this change. 
This um, novel architectural practice was all new and, new and different. But it evolved, and eventually we gave it a name after several years. Andy and Patrick called it DevOps. And now it's become good architectural practice. And we got a new tribe that appeared around it. So we have the uh, best architectural practice for the product world, which is legacy. And we have this good architectural practice for the utility world, which is the new tribe. And we would go around saying things like, it's all about, it's different. It's all about user needs. It's all about iterative cycles, automation, and feedback loops. And the old crowd, the old tribe would say to us, so was ITIL. And we would go, burn him, heretic. So anyway, the operating systems evolved, and now the same change is occurring in the platform space or in the framework space. Platform is a dreadful word because everybody calls everything a platform. It's utterly pointless. So frameworks have shifted from product to utility. So that's things like AWS Lambda, functional billing, just write code. Don't worry about the underlying infrastructure. All that things like Kubernetes, Docker, that's down, down at the bottom. And that's leading to an entire new form of practice. But it's so new, we don't even have a meme for it yet. We don't call it DevOps. Uh, Paul, who organized the uh, serverless conference, his daughter said, well, call it Jeff. I don't know why Jeff is a big name at school, so we called it Jeff Conference, until somebody comes up with a better name. And it's all about the collision of finance and development, functional billing. It changes refactoring, business model. It's huge. And it is evolving. And so that's where today you should be focused. You should be focused on serverless frameworks and the new emerging practices. They're uncertain, they're developing. And that is where the new tribe is forming. And all the other stuff, I'm afraid, is the new legacy, including DevOps. The problem is, if you run around most conferences and go, DevOps is the new legacy, they will respond, burning heretic. So at that point, we've got China, Fools May, Ecosystems, and Brexit. Or I can just uh, answer questions and answers. Or if you really don't want any more, there's always the bar. So thank you very much. Uh, whatever you wish. It's um, Brexit. No, unfortunately, we have to do these in order. <laughs> You might be very disappointed by the last one. <laughs> anyway, any questions and answers? Any, any burning? Right, China. This is 2014. Uh, two wonderful books, Outrageous Fortunes, which talked about how Confucian culture uh, would lead to the collapse of China. It was an international bestseller. Same year, another international bestseller, was Martin Jack's book, When China Rules the World, which, which talked about how Confucian culture would lead China to dominate. So in the same year, two polar opposite, best-selling books all about China. Lots of confusion. No more so than The Economist. The Economist is one of my favorite magazines because every year it writes an article about how China is about to collapse. So this is 2002, a dragon out of puff. So that's, that's, this is, uh, the, uh, the red line is the growth of China uh, in terms of uh, purchasing power parity, GDP. Uh, this is 2002, there's the economist saying, it's the end of China, and there we are in 2014, and if you just carry on, it's gone even further up. So the only thing that ever happens in terms of these articles is people reinforce uh, Hayek's idea about the dismal failure of economists and uh, how, as a subject, uh, we make astrologists look good. So, I want to talk about China. I'm going to go back and use my self-driving car. I'm going to have to start with a map. So, here's a map. Uh, user at the top. I've just removed the user just to, so I can get it on the page. Uh, what do users want from a, a car? 
They want to get from A to B, which requires route management, comfort, and affordability. Uh, they also want a better status. Well, some of them do. And that's why when you look at cars, we have some in the sort of mid-product stage and some are more commodity. Some are, you know, a bit more status than others. But if you look at a car, there's a whole bunch of underlying components that make up that car. Uh, infotainment, entertainment systems, screens, information systems, maintenance, all the way down to sensors, power supply, materials. It's actually quite a complex value chain. Again, this is a simplification. Now, that's 2015. If you roll it forward to 2025, everything becomes a lot more commodity. And we start to see new links created. Because if we want status, if we're living in a world where every car is slowly becoming, you know, provided as a utility status, a utility service, where's the status in that? So we're going to get new links, uh, maybe in the immersive design, or maybe in the infotainment system. So we live in a world, a future world, where you know, the cars are self-driving, um, they're immersive, um, but we're going to create digital status. And what do I mean by that? Well, it means we might have gold, silver, um, platinum membership. And so, you know, when, if you're a platinum member and you get into the, the self-driving utility-based car, your experience is different, say, from me if I'm a silver member. And that is how we create status. Now, this sort of stuff is going to have impacts uh, in terms of government because we have things like uh, licensing authorities and we make revenue from people having licenses and we, we don't need that. But there's also another impact. And that impact is this idea of digital subscription models. Because we have all the boring stuff. Traffic light systems, car parking, all that sort of stuff. I mean, you know, even licensing authorities, that's dull. Everybody knows that stuff. But the digital subscription model is interesting. Because if we start having you know, platinum members, you get the usual sort of thing that you know, it's the same car. You have a wonderful experience. I'm a silver member, so I'm getting adverts blasted at me. There's nowhere I can go. I'm not even driving the car. It's just taking me somewhere. At the same time, you know, giving me buy money here or whatever it happens to be. Well, that's minor inconvenience. The major inconvenience is if you're on the road and there's a whole bunch of silver members and you come along as a gold member or a platinum member, then all the other cars will automatically shift out of the way so you get to your end journey faster. That sounds good if you've got the money, except for we've now embedded social inequality into our transportation system. And the problem is, what happens when we have a flood? Then all the rich people escape, whereas everybody in the silver membership cars are stuck in long queues, and then the next day we have pitchforks. So in government, you have to think long term in terms of, because nobody in the market will. The market, you know, you, we already know it's massively inefficient and incompetent and builds far too much and wastes too much. It will think ideas like digital subscription models and embedding social inequality into a transportation system is a good idea. Now let's look at self-driving cars and China. See, I said there's 30 economic patterns. One of my favorite patterns is this one, known as peace, war, and wonder. So what happens is it's never the innovation of something like electricity, power, that changes the world. It's always the shift from product to utility. So it's the introduction of utility energy with Tesla and Westinghouse. That is what causes the explosion of higher order systems and creates new industries like Hollywood and teletyping. It creates the, the appearance of wonder, the new things that are created. The problem is you don't know which of the new things are going to be successful. You might have, we had television, well, with electricity, we got radio, we got television, we got computing, we also got the refrigeration blanket. Now, if you ask me what is more successful, or what would be more successful, a box with moving pictures or a blanket which keeps you cool at night. It's obvious 
the blanket is going to win. But it turned out it's the box with moving pictures that creates the multi-billion dollar industry. And this is because that novel and new stuff is uncertain. It's that genesis phase. Now, we also know the shift from product to utility is bad for people in the previous industry. So it was bad for gas lamp lighters. But don't worry, you could say to them, you can be a radio operator. And they would go, what's a radio? Because we hadn't created them yet. Now, this cycle of peace, war, and wonder, so it's always the process of industrialization causes this explosion of higher order systems and new things, which create new industries, which then evolve, which then industrialize, creating the explosion of new things. Bizarrely enough, we can anticipate when it's going to happen because it's not based upon individual actors' action, actions, but combined market effect. So this point of war, industrialization, tends to be very disruptive for an industry. But it is highly predictable in terms of when and what it's going to do. There's another form of disruption, which is product-to-product -product substitution, which is totally unpredictable. You don't know which way it's going to go. So we can predict using something which are called weak signals. So weak signals, do you all know what weak signals are? Vaguely? OK. Um, I'll go to hedge funds. Friends of mine, 2008, what they wanted to do was use uh, LinkedIn to see which companies were talking to other companies as part of mergers and acquisition. The idea being that companies, their, their employees, would link up with other companies' employees during the middle of an M&A. It's a ridiculous idea. See, CEOs don't tend to like each other on LinkedIn particularly not prior to an acquisition. But what CEOs do like are private jets. And fortunately, the tailplane numbers and ownership of private jets is public information, and so are the flight plans. So what you can do is map the movement of private jets across the US, looking for patterns where the private jets of one company are meeting, landing roughly the same time and same place as the private jets of another company, ideally in a place where neither has headquarters because they're being sneaky, <laughs> and they leak information like a sieve. They all go running around, oh, we've got to keep this secure, jump in the private jets, leaking. It's fabulous. So you, literally, you can map the movement of private jets. So this is what we were doing 2008, 2009. Great fun. But you can also map out these economic patterns. There's a particular signal to do with publication types. So you can identify roughly when these points of industrialization are likely to occur. So these are the points of change. This was some work done in 2014. These are the points of industrialization. So 2014, we knew big data was just on the cusp of turning into a utility. And of course, it's pretty much become a utility. I mean, nobody, well, some people run around saying we should build a product. Uh, uh, bad move these days. Uh, robotics, you know, 2020, 2025, somewhere in that region. Um, sensor as a service is likely to industrialize before things like uh, IoT. So that's uh, discrete components uh, with data associated. Um, again, uh, if you look at things like uh, green grass and other bits and pieces from Amazon, that, that's an attack in that space. Um, immersive technology, quite a bit away, 2025. Uh, intelligent agents, because everybody runs around going AI. We're, we're 20, 30, 20, we're long, long way away from general purpose intelligent agents being any form of industrialized utility. Just, you know, single purpose function, maybe. Um, so you can anticipate this stuff, or at least get a broad idea. Now, the use of this is if you take a map, you can overlay those points of industrialization, and then you can start looking at nation state competition and who's investing and, and playing games. And China is very, very, very good these days at seemingly identifying industries prior to the point of industrialization and building ecosystems of companies around that space prior to it happening. Lots of directed investment, very skillful stuff. And the point about this is when we talk about self-driving cars, people go Google, Uber, uh, actually it's more likely to be these sorts of companies that are going to own the space. 
And when you start playing this across different value chains, I mean, if you look at US Advantage, China Advantage, and Ambo, which is more neutral, I mean, this was done anyway, end of uh, mid-2015. I mean, US Advantage in cloud, um, automotive, aero, nuclear. But if you roll it forward, uh, the balance is much more towards China. In fact, when we look at cloud and we look at software in general, the big battle is really Amazon versus Alibaba. Now, China's been doing this for a long time. Uh, so back in 1993, if you look at exports uh, uh, between China and the US, um, the US dominated, that's the blue, the sort of high end. Uh, by 2013, you can see they've been moving way up the value chain, getting better and more skillful at this game. Which brings me to my next subject, which is fool's mate. Questions, or do you want me to continue, or do you want to go to the bar? <laughs> continue. Right, who wants to continue? Oh, blimey. <laughs> fool's mate. Hollywood. So let's do a quick map. Um, customer has leisure time. Uh, at leisure time, we entertain them uh, with TV programs, either through aggregator sites or branded sites. Again, quite an old map. Part of the problem is nobody wants to share their modern maps because they're used for lots of things. Um, so aggregator site is somebody like uh, Netflix or Amazon. Branded site is something like HBO, uh, Sci-Fi Channel. Have you heard of HBO, Sci-Fi Channel? Yeah? Yes? Yes? Sci-Fi. Well, super. Right. And, and that has content. And content... Uh, what you get are commission shows, uh, things like X Factor, and then over time they become acquired formats. Uh, so X Factor becomes X Factor USA, X Factor Australia, etc., etc. You do have X Factor. No? Oh, The Voice. Okay, well, you get The Voice Australia, The Voice, yeah. I've never seen The Voice. So I'm, I'm, anyway, so um, what you have is commission shows. You have artistic direction, creative studios, production talent, production systems, and you have content. You have broadcasting, distribution mechanisms, etc. Right, so here's the problem. Branded... Uh, sites, uh, branded, say, TV channels uh, like HBO, what makes them different is the shows they commission. So you have HBO-like shows or sci-fi channel-like shows. But their problem is there's a constraint. There are a limited number of creative studios, and it's expensive to produce TV shows. So what you want to do is drive that to more of a commodity. Anybody work in the media industries? No? Well, the problem is, if you say to a creative studio, we want you to be a more of a commodity, they have resistance to this idea. They're all special snowflakes. Well, fortunately, creative studios have a constraint. Production talent and production systems. It turns out the systems you require to build shows are actually quite expensive. So what you can do is you attack the production systems, you drive those to more of a commodity. Now, vendors in that space have inertia to this idea, uh, but you can do this with open approaches. So the question I have for you, if I went to a creative studio as a commissioning company and said, we're going to drive production systems, which are a big part of your cost, to more of a commodity, how do you think they would respond? Good or bad? What do you think? Go on. Have a try. Good. And you're right. They think it's a wonderful idea that you would do be so nice as to drive their production systems to more of a commodity and thereby increasing their profitability. But what is the net effect of driving production systems to more of a commodity? Bingo. You allow for the creation, remove the constraint, allow for more creative studios and more production talent. So the net effect is you actually industrialize creative studios. So rather than attacking directly the space, 
rather than attacking there, you attack the underlying system because your victims, in this case, Creative Studios, will actually support you in their own demise. It's known as Fool's Mate. And if you want an example, anybody heard of Lumberyard? It's Amazon has open sourced a AAA gaming engine, enabling anybody to build uh, uh, AAA um, uh, virtual reality style games at very low cost. It's a fab. It's the same game. Ecosystems. Do you all know what ecosystems are about? Yes. No. Right. There are very specific models. One's called two-factor market. One's called ILC. Well, there's other models as well. This is my most, my favorite play. Um, so again, this is 12 years old. So what you do is you take a pre-existing act, a product, and you industrialize it to a utility service. Like compute, you turn into utility compute, say EC2. And what happens is if you expose it as an API, other people will build on top. They will build new things. Now, you do not have to look at what they're doing. You just have to look at the consumption of your service to identify future patterns. So if, you're, if I build something like a utility service for compute, you're all building on top. Let's say you're all building kit and internet, except for you three who are doing something about big data. I will notice that all your traffic is low, but this is growing. So there's something interesting in that space. So then I commoditize that space to a new service, like a utility big data type approach, and everybody cheers, except for you. You're miserable because I've just eaten your business model. And everybody starts building on top of that. So what you're doing is you're getting everybody building on top to act as your free research and development department. Thank you very much. You are leveraging the entire metadata of the ecosystem to spot future patterns, which you are then commoditizing to component services. And it's known as ILC. 12 years old, and it's very simple. So if you're the supplier and there's an ecosystem of companies building on top, you're commoditizing components, exposing through APIs, people building on top, you commoditize, people build on top. And the net effect of this is this. Your apparent rate of innovation accelerates with the size of the ecosystem because you're all doing the innovation for me. You are my free research and development department. The bigger the ecosystem gets, the more innovative I appear. At the same time, my customer focus improves with the size of the ecosystem because I'm mining the metadata to spot future trends. So the bigger the ecosystem, the more customer focused and the more innovative I become. But of course, because I've got economies of scale, I benefit from efficiency as well. And that increases with the size of the ecosystem. <laughs> so I become more innovative, more customer focused, more efficient simultaneously with the size of the ecosystem. Does anybody know of a company which seems to be doing that? Amazon, right. If you are under the illusion that Amazon is difficult to compete with today, in five years' time, their ecosystem will be bigger because they will have built more component services and attracted more, and they will be far tougher in five years than they are today. The bigger the ecosystem gets, the more innovative, customer focused, and more efficient they will become. You've got it easy against Amazon today. Five years from now, they'll be a lot, lot tougher. You are all aware of that, aren't you? Some people are saying, well, eventually they'll fail. No. These ideas of be one of innovative customer focus or efficient and porter, brilliant stuff for the 1990s. This was broken 12 years ago. So if you look at what Amazon, how they play the game, you know, they build compute, people build on top, they come out with things like, say, machine learning, they build on top, they come up with platforms, machine learning platforms, now they're building discrete AI sensitive services, they're constantly moving up the value chain. A bit like China. So in summary, summary, uh, more changes happening, we, uh, particularly with serverless at the moment. 
Serverless, by the way, is Amazon's, I think, second fastest growing service. It might be first now. Um, and that's an attack on the entire software industry. They're going for the lot. Um, there's more constant uh, changes coming towards us, points of industrialization. I mean, we've, we're in the middle of the big day, so we've got robotics, currency, sensors, loads more coming towards us. And, and this stuff impacts a wide variety of value chains. That's assuming you understand what your value chain is. Turns out that most organizations don't. Now, there are some really skilled players in this. Amazon is one, Alibaba's another. Um, but this is not just at a, a local level. This is also at a national level in terms of government play. There's some really good advanced techniques, things like IOC and things like sophisticated play, like Fool's, Ma uh, Fool's Mate. Of course, this stuff all assumes uh, you can see the map. For most organizations, we don't. But that's OK as long as you are competing against other people like yourself. Because if you think of uh, business as a cat fight, it's OK to be blind as long as everybody else is. Because if you're, if you're hopeless, you're OK. Just as long as, as everybody else in your industry is hopeless, then, then you're fine. The problem is when somebody who isn't comes into your industry and then they're afraid it's game over. So finally, we get to Brexit. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, that was. Uh, <laughs> so, any Q and A? Any questions? Yes, sir. Wait, wait, one second. Oh. Um, would be nice if the uh, the guy who does the question could stand up. It would be nice. No problem. So Hello, on, sir. Hi, again. Uh, so on the way here, I had an idea I grew to like quite much. Um, I thought that uh, jobs, as we conceive them today, yep. um, are consisting of a lot of bundling. So put on one of your maps, the, uh, a typical job, CEO, product manager, software developer, whatever, yep. would be all over the place. Mm -hmm. right? It would have components on the lower left, components on the upper right. Yep, yep. And my, my question to you, sir, is um, do you have any idea on a societal level how to unbundle this so people can do more stuff that's valuable and less stuff that's so, not? So a friend of mine, um, Kelsey, actually mapped himself. Uh, he was working at Docker, and as a result of mapping himself, he, he left and joined Google and now runs the Kubernetes. Uh, he's the evangelist for Kubernetes. Um, so I know people who've mapped themselves. I, I haven't done it personally. I, when it comes to mapping, I talk about activities in, in terms of um, a Genesis custom-built product commodity. It turns out that data and practices and even knowledge and, in fact, all forms of social capital that I'm... Sorry, all forms of capital that I'm aware of, evolved through a similar pattern as well. And so they have the same sort of characteristic changes, but we call them different terms. So with uh, practices, we go novel, emerging, good, and best. With data, it becomes basically unmodeled, divergent opinions, convergent, then it becomes modeled. Um, so there's no reason why um, that shouldn't be possible that I know of. It's just I've never done it. Okay? But thank you. Good question. Any others? <laughs> so, for, um, just on this point, in, when it comes to mapping, I, I assumed everybody else in the world was mapping. So I, I developed, I actually do one day a year teaching at uh, uh, Judge Business School for Mark Thompson teaching at the university now, uh, teaching people how to map, because it turns out that other people weren't. Um, I assumed everybody was. Uh, it took me another six years. I used to speak at conferences and explain it. It was sort of embarrassed that, you know, this is how I do my rubbishy form of mapping. Um, but n I could never find anybody else's example. I, th I, I always assumed they were very expensive books I couldn't afford or whatever. Uh, and then I, I eventually discovered that people weren't. And it's amazing. There's a wonderful piece of work by Fitzer, which looks at um, uh, a decomposition of CEO impacts. And it turns out, um, he looked at a huge number of CEOs, uh, that 75% have no different impact than random charts. And of the remaining 25%, I think 20% were slightly negative and about 5% were, were slightly positive. 
Um, and the point about this is that you could randomly replace most of the board with people off the streets and you wouldn't actually notice. Uh, the, it's not a very popular paper in most of the management journals, but it, it's, a, it's a very, it's a, it's a well-known paper. Sorry, yes. Um, you had this blue table about predicting the war time. Oh, so points of war, points of industrialization. Yes, exactly. Dreadful term, but yes, I came um, up And how exactly did you predict at what at what time the war starts? Because you talked about the weak signals, but could you give an example for one of them? Yeah, um, hang on, I'm just gonna do 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 jump to something else. Uh, da, 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 hang on a second. This is more graphs. Are you okay with more graphs? Right. So when I first did this. So in 2005, I was looking to try and understand the whole concept of evolution, change, movement. And um, I knew of something called Everett Rogers' diffusion curve. Have you heard of Everett Rogers' diffusion curve? Uh, made famous by Jeffrey Moore, Crossing the Chasm. Have you heard of Crossing the Chasm? Wonderful. Right. So what you've got is adoption over time. Now. Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Moore uses the non-cumulative form, which is the orange, so that's adoption rate. If you just accumulate that, that's the diffusion curve. The diffusion curve is the original piece of work. And uh, what, so what you've got is the early market, the chasm, and then the mainstream, and then eventually laggards. Now, my first attempt at doing this, I thought, well, this is going to be really, really simple. Because obviously, there's going to be some sort of percentage at which things change from being you know, custom built to being, say, a commodity to being a product. Sorry, from being custom built to a product to a commodity. And all I need to do is find the percentage. That'll be easy. So I've got a quick question. Smartphones. Who thinks a smartphone is a commodity here? Who doesn't? OK, so we've got a bit of disagreement. Right, what percent, how many of you have smartphones? Pretty much everyone, right. Now, given the fact that, uh, you know, gold bars, highly industrialized, standardized gold bars, defined, we have commodity markets, just in case you didn't know. So just in case you didn't know, I said that, so I'm going to ask you the question. Do you think gold bars are a commodity? Of course they are. Right, how many of you have a gold bar? Come on, somebody must have a gold bar. <laughs> All right. The problem is, the problem is, you can't just look at adoption in society and connect it to the phase of evolution because it just doesn't work. Data just doesn't support it. it turns out that what actually happens is something appears and it diffuses to 100% adoption of its applicable market. That's the A1. And then something else appears, a better version of it, and it diffuses to a slightly bigger market, 100% of A2, and then a slightly different version appears, and it diffuses to a bigger market, A3, and it goes on and on. And this might be Genesis. This might be custom built. That could be product. That might be product. That might be product. There might be 10 more products to come until eventually it becomes a commodity. And so you have no idea when it's going to occur. And so that's where I was initially. And I thought, damn, nothing I could do. And then I was looking at publications. And then I noticed that with the first phones, you used to get publications like this. The telephone and how we use it. How you hold the telephone. How do you speak into the telephone? Do we do that today? Because it's embedded in social knowledge. Electricity, light bulbs. We used to put up signs like this. <coughs> do not attempt to light with a match. Use the switch. Do we do that today? Because it's embedded in social knowledge. So I started to look at publication types. And what I noticed is that when something appears, the publications talk about the wonder of something. Then they transition to talking about building construction awareness. So you start off with the wonder of radio, and then it's on to how to build 
construct your own radio set. Then we talk about operation, maintenance, and feature differentiation. My radio is better or worse than your radio. Then we talk about just use. We don't care about the radio anymore. It's just what's on the radio. So what I did was I built a certainty axis based upon those publication types, found the point of stability when it shifted from being publications talking about operation, maintenance, feature differentiation to use, took that point in time, discovered what the applicable market was, and then called that the point of ubiquity, and then simply plotted back ubiquity and certainty. And onto that, overlay the publication types. And that's where that came from. Okay? Now, the point in that, there is a weak signal I can use to identify when the shift from product to commodity is likely to occur and it's based upon publication types. Now, if you ask me what the weak signal is, I used to have several, and foolishly I told people, and the problem with weak signals, they're very easy to poison. So, it, in, we used to monitor Russian sailors at uh, the gardens. So when they put out their clothes, you knew the Russian ships were about to set sail, because they'd done their washing, so they put the clothes on the clothesline, and so you would know the Russian ships were about to set sail. So what the Russians did was buy all their sailors tumble dryers. So now you don't know. So the problem is, is um, uh, I had more signals, but foolishly I, I mentioned, and then suddenly I found those signals no longer worked. So I have one about publication types, and that's what I use to create that graph. But what I am looking for, I'm afraid, I keep that to myself. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Thank you. Pleasure. So it took about 9,000 data points to do that initial evolution curve. Any more questions? All right. Technical one. Technical one. <laughs> yeah, um, because I do a lot of uh, serverless architecture. So um, what I love about serverless uh, systems is like I can argue with with people from finance about my system because there's like money involved, right? And my question at you is like you have a lot of experience with serverless systems. You built the first one, maybe. Yeah. So so uh, Zimki. So one of the big things yeah. with Zimki, uh, which was this uh, framework where you built entire applications, JavaScript front and back end. This was uh, 2005, beginning of 2006. It grew. It, we saw the change of practice. So, for example, um, when you build an application, uh, there may be 50 different functions in an application. And I built a trading platform in about a day, day and a half. And it turned out that when I looked at the cost, that about two of my functions were incurring about 70, 80% of the cost. And the reason for that was because I was lousy at writing code. Because now you're seeing price per function. So you're seeing the operational cost of code. So suddenly, I've got a financial incentive to refactor my systems. Beforehand, there is no financial incentive to refactor because people go, well, it's sunk cost. But now, because you've operationalized it, there is a real financial incentive to do so. And in fact, it changes your whole investment approach. Um, so often, you, you know, we used to have systems where we go, should we spend more money on marketing to get more users? Well, we didn't actually know what the cost of those users were. And now we can actually say, well, actually, the users cost this much when they're running through the system. That marketing value isn't worth it unless we refactor the code and reduce the price of the code, in which case it now becomes worthwhile. It totally changes your approach to business model. It also introduces things like, so we did a lot of what we call worth-based development. We built systems for free based upon a metric of value of that the system would generate. And, and that was because we could operationalize all the cost. So all of this stuff is coming, and yeah. big, big changes. So if yeah. you're in the serverless space, good move. Yeah, this was exactly my question. I didn't ask it. I have one more thing uh, sure. about your pri uh, about your opinion. In the beginning, you said this. You told us the story about you as a fake CEO, right? Yeah. So you had like this. It turns out I'm not the only one. N yeah, I know, and I feel the same with Scrum and Agile. Everyone wants to be Agile, and it's like blind cats everywhere. So what's your opinion of? Every uh, company wants to go, let's so, do Scrum, let's do this, and I so, feel, yeah. So I was, um, I'm also the chaos monkey for SAFE, so I went along to, SAFE is the scaled agile framework, I went along and uh, to their event, their leadership event, and basically said, you yeah, know, it's great, but it has constraints, it has spaces where it works, 
There is no such thing as the magic one-size-fits-all method. I know people run around, oh, you don't want to use Six Sigma and all the rest of it. If it's highly industrialized, where you can specify, that's absolutely what you want to do. That's where you want to use it. Um, one of the problems, so let me just go back to something. I'll go back to the self-driving car in Elvish. Just to re-explain why you want to break things into small contracts. Right. So normally, companies don't have a map. So you don't understand your landscape. So rather than doing, you know, using appropriate methods, you can't see it. So what we do is we outsource the whole lot. And this is a disaster. It's a disaster because when we outsource it, we try and specify what's involved. The stuff on the right-hand side, which is highly industrialized, we can specify. The stuff on the left-hand side, you cannot specify. It's uncertain. It will change. So what will happen is when you outsource the whole lot in one go, you get a contract written because you want to be doing what's right, you invariably will incur massive change, uh, change control cost overruns. It's almost inevitable. And you'll get into a fight with a vendor, and the vendor will say, well, it's all your fault because you didn't know what you want. You knew what you wanted in some places, not the others. And then somebody will go, well, next time we need to specify it better. You cannot specify it better. You need to break down and use different methods at the same time. And this is a constant point of failure uh, with organizations. And so what happens then is somebody says, oh, we'll do Agile. And so they do something on the left-hand side, and they use an Agile approach. And of course, it's more suited. And then somebody goes, oh, that worked there. We'd better use Agile everywhere. And of course, it's not suited on the right-hand side. So eventually, somebody will come along and say, well, we should use Six Sigma out. And it will work better on the right-hand side. And so somebody will go, we should use Six Sigma everywhere. Have, you, has it, have any of you experienced this yo-yo? The answer is you need it all. There is no such thing as a single one-size-fits-all method. The problem is most organizations, um, their map looks like that. Okay? They don't have it. And because they can't see it, they can't do one side. They, they, you know, they think, well, how are we going to deal with this? <laughs> Let's use Agile everywhere. Wow, sounds great. Let's outsource it all. Sounds a good idea. Oh, Agile worked really bit on that white bit over there. Oh, we should use it for the rest of the white bit as well. That's how most organizations are. Has any of you in this room experienced that? Absolutely. Yeah? You've been through it. It's horror. It's, it's like... It's blind, blind, flying. blind flying. Good way of saying it. Did that answer your question, sir? Of course. Thank you. Pleasure. Any more? Because I've certainly overrun. And I'm sure All the right. cameraman is dying to get home. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, when will China overtake Amazon? <laughs> oh, I noticed or you the other way around, I, I don't know. I noticed you didn't say Alibaba there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, right. you, you're immediately going, it's the government. So, um, yeah, Alibaba and, and Amazon is a very, very interesting gameplay that's coming towards us. Um, just having a quick look to see if I've got something. Uh, da, 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 da. So, so expect that battle to be going on in the next uh, ten, <coughs> 10 years or so. Um, the, part of the problem, unfortunately, I haven't got what I wanted to show you. Part of the problem is our understanding of economic systems. Um, so, right, China, by the way, if you didn't know, is probably the world's largest venture capital firm. That's how it operates. Uh, it's very, very skillful. There's a real misunderstanding that goes on in economic systems. And I'm, I'm hoping I can find something while I'm chatting away to you. I'm trying to search at the same time. So give me a second. 
Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, too many. I've got one of these decks with 10,000 slides. I really wish I'd organized this slightly better. OK. <laughs> Give me a second. Do you, do you all know Hayek, Smith, Keynes? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you know your economists? Yes? All right. Ah, here we are. Right. So if you go to the US, who's been to the US? Have you noticed how politics in the US is a little bit different? <laughs> OK. So if you go centrally planned to laissez-faire, and you talk to US economists, they will talk about Marx and Keynes as being on the left-hand side. And they will describe it as uh, the more communist model, and that's how China operates. But on the right-hand side, you've got Smith, Hayek, and Friedman. And that's the more capitalist model, and that's how the US operates. Now, that's really bizarre for a lot of European eco economists. Because if you ask European economists, they'll stick Marx on the centrally planned, they'll put Friedman more on the laissez-faire, and they put Hayek, Smith, and Keynes in the middle. Smith was a great believer in government. All of them were. So what you have is that's the communist over there. This is more the laissez-faire type approach. And this is more the social capitalist model in the middle. And this is what China operates like. Now, the problem is you can see that from a European point of view. China operates more in the middle. US is more on the right-hand side. But if you talk to people in the US, the problem is they don't have the same model. It's really difficult for people to understand that. They separate it into this extreme sort of binary. Has anybody experienced that? Any economist in the room talking with the US? No? OK. Um, so China is probably one of the most skillful venture capital firms out there. And it operates like a venture capital firm. Massive amounts of directed investment, building ecosystems of companies uh, in particular spaces focused on technology. And they're very, very good at it. And uh, if, if you've ever been to China, it's just, just fairly, fairly stunning. And of course, you've got very skillful companies that have developed. And those companies are very good at playing games of last man standing and all the rest of it. Now, Amazon is also a fierce and very capable competitor. So that's why we're likely to see that battle between the two. So your question is, who will win? That I don't know. <laughs> that depends on players' actions, individual players' actions. The thing is, what we know are aggregated effects. But it's like uh, Apple versus BlackBerry. Apple versus BlackBerry, no one knew who would win. Christensen, ever heard of Clayton Christensen? Disruptive... Right, he said Apple would fail, BlackBerry. What happened? Apple succeeded, BlackBerry failed. Was it because Christensen was daft? No, it's because it was unpredictable. Things like product to utility shifts are predictable. So these are things like cloud. We know what's going to happen. We're going to have a whole bunch of vendors and companies in the product space have inertia to the change. We're going to get what's called a punctuated equilibrium, exponential growth, new entrants coming in, explosion of higher order systems, disruption of the past. We can even go, we're going to have people running around saying it's going to be cheaper, but it's not. Jevons paradox. We're going to get more stuff being built. You're going to get co-evolution of practice. So we can even talk about the organizational changes. So there's some things we know and some things we don't. And in fact, in this case, it depends upon players' actions. And so you don't know which way it will go. But both of them are fierce competitors. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one more. Yes. I mean, what, the, the Brexit thing is a backward step. So what about the Brexit? It's not forward. It's going back, isolating. So this is different, I think, no? Yeah. And it's an interesting about that, isn't it? <laughs> and on that note, I will say thank you very much. <laughs> and there is the bar. <laughs> um, so Brexit, again, depends upon individual players' actions and what the government does. It's not a, sorry, well, it's not a zero-sum game here. Um, I, it's beneficial for both governments to have some form of, uh, uh, both 
uh, when I say governments, um, of both the union, because it's not, it's not yet a single government, um, uh, both the union and uh, the UK, another union, uh, to have beneficial trade arrangements. It's not a zero-sum game. Um, there are opportunities for both. Uh, there's always, uh, um, shall we say, um, um, lots of doom and gloom predictions, and that, that's, that's fairly normal. Will it be difficult? I'm sure it will be, but I also have a lot of, uh, um, uh, a lot of belief in the potential possibilities for both sides. And that's as much as I will say. <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I think that was powerful stuff and um, uh, creates the need for a beer, I think. Uh, so the bar is open. Um, I don't know if Simon will stick around or whatever. Yes. All right, cool. I, I, am, I am trapped in this country. <laughs> you are, until tomorrow at least. <laughs> uh, thank you for attending, Lindos. Um, hope to see you next time. Thank you.